the health at a different location, and this is a new venue. Uh, and of course, that is an indication of how quickly the city of Shanghai seems to change every time I come back there's something new and different. Uh, what I will speak today has something to do with this. status of many of these cities which became important cities in a colonial era. And Shanghai uh, very much it, it owes its character and reputation and importance uh, to a colonial connection. Uh, I will speak about my city, uh, the city of Kalkara. Uh, and some of its uh, historical memories uh, today uh, in, in this case. Uh, this is connected to the most recent book uh, I have written, uh, The Black Hole of Empire, which is actually a, there are two, two parts to that book, or two sides to that book, even though these two sides keep uh, mixing up, intertwining through the text of the book. One is a history precisely of the colonial settlement of the city of Calcutta. It's specifically colonial locations in what originally began as the fort, the fortified settlement of the English East India Company. That is how the city began. Uh, and it is a history of that fort and its surrounding areas in the last 250 years, uh, roughly from the middle of the 18th century to the present. That is one part of the book, or one strand of the book. But the other one is a more grand history of empire, uh, modern empire, in its conceptual side, but I would clarify that to say that I'm not really interested in what you might call an intellectual history of empire, because in some sense the intellectual history of modern empire has been attempted by many people and there is very rich uh, and important literature around that. Uh, yesterday when uh, Jomo Sudaram was speaking, we heard one side of this uh, intellectual history of modern imperialism uh, and its ramifications and importance in trying to understand the world situation today. Um, so that is not the history I wanted to speak. Uh, but I was more interested in trying to look at the connections between conceptual changes in empire, in modern empire, and the practices of empire. In other words, the techniques of governance, the techniques of maintaining order in the world, the techniques of diplomacy, techniques of international law. In other words, empire as practice. And I was particularly interested in trying to make some of these connections between the way empire was actually practiced in a colonial city. So a large part of the book is about these places and uh, people and events within the city of Calcutta in the way they could tell us something about the practices and techniques of empire and the associated intellectual justification. So uh, that is the broad uh, subject matter of this book. Uh, I cannot uh, give you a full presentation on the entire book here. So what I chose to do was to actually focus on one particular colonial monument, a particular monument a very specific, what used to be a very specific part of the city, it has been moved, and I'll tell you the story about how the colonial monument was moved from one place to another. Uh, and 
Maybe everything around that monument Monuments, as you know, always tell stories. Uh, so there are entire narratives about the monuments, so, you know, centered around the monuments. And these are stories about the past. What I would like to suggest is that over time, uh, just as monuments may either remain at one place, or monuments may be destroyed and replaced by something else, all monuments may shift it from one place to another place. Very often what happens is monuments get new names. The same monument is renamed and another name is given to the monument. But associated with each of these changes, there is a change in the story. The story that the monument tells uh, begins to change. And a different story is attached to the same structure. Uh, this is a, something that always interests me, and I think it has something to do with what I was suggesting earlier. How are uh, practices, actual practices on the ground, uh, you might even say everyday practices, how are they related to memories and beliefs and uh, concepts about large historical structures? large historical formations such as nations and colony and empire. So that is probably the subject. I will uh, read from some of the some sections of this paper. I will not read the whole thing. But I will stop from time to time and elaborate and explain what I So the travels of the monument. The Lausy Square is the heart of the administrative district of Calcutta. This is the square. Uh, on the western side, as you have seen, of the square stands one of the more distinctive buildings of colonial Calcutta, the General Post Office. Built in the classical style with Corinthian columns and a Renaissance dome. High up on the eastern wall of the post office, there is a small plaque. It says somewhat obscurely, quoting from the slack, the brass lines in the adjacent steps and pavements mark the position and extent of part of the southeast bastion of old Fort William. The extreme southeast point being 95 feet from this wall. These brass lines are difficult to find, but along one of the lower steps, there is a strip of what looks like wrought iron running southwards for a few yards and then coming to an abrupt stop. There is no further clue here to the mystery of the Fort War. Leading south from the Lousy Square is Council House Street, which runs past the yard of St. John's Church built in 1787. The churchyard has some of the oldest funerary architecture from British Calcutta, including the mausoleum of Joe Chana, who founded the first English settlement in Calcutta. More to our interest, however, is a monument that stands near the western wall of the churchyard, surrounded by overgrown shrubs and piles of rubbish. This is the monument. It is a white marble obelisk on an octagonal base with inscribed tablets on six of its sides and a floral frieze on the other two. The main inscription reads as follows. This monument has been erected by Lord Curzon, Viceroy and Governor General of India in the year 1902. Upon the site and in reproduction of the design, of the original monument to the memory of 123 persons who perished in the black hole prison of Old Fort William on the night of 28th of June 1756. The former memorial was raised by a surviving fellow sufferer, J. Z. Caldwell, governor of Fort William, 
On the spot where the bodies of the dead had been thrown into the ditch of the rebel, it was removed in 1821. The next tablet has the names of 27 persons who although originally listed as having died in the black hole. Two other tablets list 54 additional victims whose names had been says, this is what it says on the uh, monument now, recovered from oblivion by reference to contemporary documents. Now, this memorial that you see is actually in the wrong place, because this is neither the site of the black hole prison, nor where the bodies of the victims were allegedly thrown. At the base of the monument is another inscription, which says, this monument was erected in 1902 by Lord Curzon on the original site of the black hole, northwest corner of the Lazi Square, and removed thence to the cemetery of St. John's Church, Calcutta, in 1940. So we are dealing with two monuments. The original monument, by all accounts, stood somewhere at the northwest corner of what was then called the Tank Square. We know from the records that the ruins of the old fort of Calcutta, including the site of the Black Hole prison, were demolished in 1818. The Orwell monument stood outside the walls of the old fort. It is not clear why the original monument was pulled down in 1821, but we do know that it was designed and built probably in 1760 by John Zephania Orwell, a survivor of the Black Hole incident, to whom we owe the only detailed narrative of the event. The inscription on the front of the monument then had the names of 48 persons, who it was announced, quote, and this is that I'm quoting, this is the inscription of the original monument. What you see there is the front piece, the front page, uh, the title page, of Holder's original book, which has the manuscript, the, the uh, narrative of the first account of the so-called black hole deaths, uh, published in 1758. So, the original inscription had the names of 48 of us, who, quote, with sundry other inhabitants, military and militia, to the number of 123 persons, were by the tyrannic violence of Sarajul Dora, Suha of Bengal, suffocated in the black hole prison of Fort William in the night of 20th day of June 1756, and promiscuously thrown the succeeding morning into the ditch of the ravelin of this place. This monument is erected by their surviving fellow sufferer, J.Z. Holmberg. On the reverse of the monument, the inscription then said, this horrid act of violence was amply as deservedly, was as amply as deservedly revenged on Sir Jadola by his Majesty's arms under the conduct of Vice Admiral Watson and Colonel Clive in 1757. So what happened in Calcutta on the night of June 20, 1756? The center of Calcutta in 1756 was a small fort with earth and ballast bastions and brick walls. This was the fortified settlement of the East India Company in Bengal. The town had grown phenomenally in the first half of the 18th century, and its total population in 1756 could have been in the region of 100,000. The British population probably numbered no more than 400, mostly male, a large number of being soldiers. The Indian population lived in the black town, north of the fort. The city at this time was divided quite clearly into what was known as black town and white town. This division continued very much until the beginnings of the 20th century. The company, East India Company, had held from 1698 to the three villages constituting Calcutta as the landlord. 
with the right to settle people and collect revenue. In 1717, the East India Company secured from the Mughal government, the Mughal Emperor, permission to trade without paying customs duties. The Nawab of Bengal, who was the local governor of Bengal, allowed the company's goods to be transported without duties, but not those that had belonged to the company's officials. However, company servants routinely tried to carry out their private trade under the company's seal to evade customs charges. Let me explain this a little bit because it, it has a great deal to do with what the, the British were actually doing in India at this time. Uh, through the 18th century, when the trade with India uh, expanded greatly, the East India Company was of course there mainly to buy Indian manufactured goods, mainly cotton textiles, which was the principal uh, item that was bought in India, just as silk was the major item brought, uh, bought from China. Uh, but in India, it was, in Bengal in particular, it was mostly uh, cotton textiles. Uh, and in order to pay for this, the British were basically trying to finance this trade through the import of silver from Europe. Uh, there was no other way in which, because there was no really any other commodity uh, from Europe which was brought back or sold in India. So they had to import a lot of silver. Uh, over time, of course, there was enormous pressure from Britain to stop the export of silver bullion to India and to find, try and finance the company's trade through other means. And this explains why there was enormous pressure on the East India Company officials in India to try and secure other sources of financing the trade. And finally, it, became, it, it ended up in trying to gain land, control over land in India, so that it was the uh, revenues from the land taxes taxes to land which would go into financing the uh, trade, so the buying of cotton textiles from India which would be exported to Europe. Uh, but alongside there was another very major part which was, what were, which was the private business of the company officials. Uh, now these you know, company officials were supposedly salaried people by the company but the salaries were extremely small. And if you remember the, the time in the 18th century, it took you know, six to nine months by, to come by boat uh, all around Africa. You know, Suez Canal had not been opened up then. So uh, six to nine months was the average time that it took to, for a, a journey to India. It was obviously dangerous. Uh, in India, the average, it was estimated something like 30% of the Europeans who came to India died in India because of illnesses, the many tropical diseases against which, of course, they had little immunity. Uh, so it took much more than simply what the company offered them as salaries uh, to be a sufficient attraction for them to come to India. And what finally uh, won out was the prospects of making large sums of money through private trading outside what they were supposed to be trading uh, on the, in the name of the company. And it was the private trade which was the biggest attraction. And the private trade became so lucrative because many of the privileges that the company enjoyed, such as not paying customs duties, it was the private trade where the company officials used the same privileges, although legally they were not entitled to it, but they used the same privileges to indulge in their private trade and make very large sums of money uh, in order to go back to Britain after 10 or 15 years of service in India and uh, lead a fairly comfortable life. Uh, so this was the major subject of the so-called uh, private trade. The 
this is still not the settlement in Calcutta. This was the fortified settlement. It was steadily fortified through the first half of the 18th century, sometimes with the permission of the local Nawaz government, but often without his permission. The company's directors in London were always concerned about the need to defend their settlements in Bengal in order to protect their trade. Throughout the early 18th century, they sent repeated instructions to their officials in Bengal to make fortifications strong enough to discourage any attempts of the local powers, but to do it in as private a manner as you can. Uh, this is very interesting because in some, some sense this, is, this was very different from the way in which Europeans would have done trade in any other European country. Uh, nowhere in Europe would you expect a British company, let's say, trading in Germany or trading in Italy, to actually insist that they would have a fortified settlement. This, this was clearly impossible with the, with the European nations. But, but this is the standard practice of Dutch and British and French uh, traders in, in uh, Asia that they would insist that they would build a trading position for which they would build fortifications which would be defended by their own soldiers. And in many cases, as you know, in the case of China, this became a very major issue. Uh, this is what the Dutch began in, in uh, Java, uh, now Indonesia. Uh, the Portuguese, of course, started this even earlier. Uh, they were the first to actually bring in uh, gunboats uh, with their trading ships and uh, have guns mounted on their boats. This was never the practice in the Indian Ocean before. Uh, but the European traders in, in the East, uh, I will uh, elaborate on this a little bit later, uh, from the very beginning, they uh, were convinced that the local laws of so-called Oriental rulers were not really worth any value. That the local laws of the Oriental rulers were against the idea of free commerce, and therefore, because these laws did not have any inherent sanctity. The European traders were within their rights to defend the right of free commerce, if necessary, by the use of force. This, of course, was part of the justification in European international law as it began to be developed through the 17th century. Uh, the famous lawyer Hugo Grotius, the Dutch lawyer, who uh, was very important in the law of the seas, was you know, one of the classic texts of international law, uh, still remains the sort of basic fundamental law of the seas. Uh, and uh, Grotius's principal argument was that, in fact, to defend the right, because the seas were free, that is to say nobody had sovereignty over the seas, to defend the freedom of commerce, European traders and companies, and even European individuals were within their rights to defend their right to trade by using force if necessary. It was through this legal justification that they insisted that the Europeans had the right to build fortifications around their trading posts and trading stations. Uh, anywhere in Asia. In April 1756, the 80-year-old Nawab, the ruler of Bengal, Nawab Adiwati Khan, died. His grandson, Siraj succeeded him and immediately demanded that the company stop any further fortification of Calcutta. The Nawab's emissary, however, was unceremoniously dismissed by Roger Drake, governor of Fort William. Humiliated, he returned to the capital of Mushirabad and complained, What honor is left to us when a few, few traders who have not yet learned to wash their bottoms reply to the ruler's order 
by explaining this anymore. So Raja Dawda was in a rage. He retaliated immediately. On 16 June 1756, Siraj Dabab personally leading a force of some 30,000 men with heavy artillery arrived in the vicinity of Calcutta. At 4 p.m., the number of armed men available to defend it was around 500, of whom no more than half were Europeans, including soldiers, militia, and volunteers, the rest consisting of Armenians, Indo Portuguese, and Indians. The North forces began an assault on all fronts on June 16. After three days of battle, the majority of the council at Fort William was arguing in favor of abandoning the fort and retreating to the ships anchored in the river. Morale was desperately low and, and quote, I'm quoting from one of the reports, every black fellow who could make his escape ran away. On the night of June 18th, it was decided that the European women in the fort should be escorted to the boats waiting on the river. When the North Army resumed its assault in the morning, and the ship Dodali arrived up the river below the fort, there was a general desertion. Everyone who could find a place on the boat left. By noon, Governor Drake himself was on, sailing downstream. Soon, there were no more boats available, even though many, including eight members of the council, were still waiting in the fort, ready to leave. The defenders were stranded in the besieged fort. The governor himself, having ingloriously deserted, the remaining members of the council elected Hogwell as the governor of Fort William. But with so many senior officers gone, it was impossible to maintain discipline. Many European soldiers virtually mutinied, forcing their way into the stores, helping themselves to the liquor, and subsequently deserting in the night. On June 20th, after further fighting, Holwell was left with no more than 150 men, demoralized and exhausted of strength and vigor. He signaled for a truce. By the evening, the fort was occupied by the Nawab's troops. Holwell was brought before Siraj who expressed much resentment against Rebek. The Indo Portuguese, Armenian, and Indian men in the fort were allowed to leave. The remaining Europeans were left in charge of the Nawab's guard. No violence was done to them. At the time, some of the Europeans, apparently under the influence of liquor, misbehaved with the guards, at least one of whom received fatal injuries. When this was reported, either the Nawab or one of his officers ordered that the Europeans would be put in confinement within the fort. It was discovered that there was a cell, picturesquely called the Black Hole, which was used by fort officials to lock up unruly Europeans. This was where the European prisoners were confined during the night of June 20. The first accounts of the Black Hole incident were produced between June 1756 and February 1757. The historian Brigitte Mukha has carefully compiled a full list of 13 such sources that have come down to us. Mukha shows with impeccable reasoning that John Zephania Orwell was directly involved in the production of every single one of these narratives. That is to say, they are not independent pieces of evidence, but rather all of them the result of consultation with Orwell or of a reading of his various descriptions of the event. It is to all of this narrative, then, that we must turn, as indeed as everyone else in the last 250 years, for an account of what happened on the night of June 20, 1776, and at Fort William. Holwell, that is Holwell, came from an emerging family with education. He was trained as a doctor and came out to India as a surgeon's mate. In Calcutta, he showed his skills in judicial and revenue administration and became mayor of the settlement as, the, and as well as the youngest member of the council. After his final return to Britain in 1760, 
He emerged as something of a specialist in Indian affairs, wrote historical and ethnographic tracts, and became a fellow of the Royal Society. He was keen to display his superior moral and intellectual qualities in comparison with the usual run of Greek adventurers who came out to India in the coming service. He wrote what was called the genuine narrative. On board the ship, the ship that he was traveling in, in in February 1757, on his journey back to Britain from Bengal. By then, Calcutta had been recaptured by Clive's army. We will talk about that later. When Homer's narrative was published in 1758, Sir Lajadola had been defeated at Palachi and killed. Robert Clive and the East India Company were in full charge of affairs in Bengal. So this is how Hollywood's genuine narrative began. Figure to yourselves, my friend, if possible, the situation of 146 villages, exhausted by continual fatigue and action, thus crammed together in a cube of about 18 feet in a close sundry night in the main road, shut up to the eastward and the southward, the only quarters from whence air could reach us by dead walls and by a wall and door to the north, open only to the westward by two windows, strongly barred with iron, from which we would receive scarce any the least circulation of fresh air. Homer and the other European defenders of the fort had been ordered at about 8 o'clock that night into the black hole prison by the Lord's guards and forced through the only door. It was not Siddhartha, however, it is careful to point out, who had ordered them to be locked up in that particular room. What followed, he says, was the result of revenge and resentment in the breasts of the guards to whose custody we were delivered. In his attitude and mental voice, Holden was quite different from most of his fellow prisoners. They were far too susceptible to the violence of passions, whereas he knew immediately, quote, that the only chance we had left for sustaining this misfortune and surviving the night was the preserving of a calm mind and quiet resignation to our fate. This indeed is the dominant theme of his narrative. It was not the tyranny of the arts or the cruelty of the arts, but the descent of a crowd of ordinary European men placed in a situation of dangerous adversity into mindless disorder and his own heroic struggle to retain control and discipline over his body. Looking out the window, Holder noticed that an old guard who seemed to carry some compassion for us in his countenance. He spoke to him and offered him a thousand rupees the next day if he would arrange to shift half of the prisoners to another room. The guard went away and came back to announce that the law had gone to sleep and no one dared to wake him up. At this time, all the notice that having perspired profusely, everyone was inflicted by a raging thirst, which increased in proportion as the body was drained of its moisture. Again, Holwell could be only a mute witness to the folly of his ignorant fellow passengers, uh, fellow prisoners. They decided to take off their clothes. Quote, in a few minutes, I believe every man was stripped for a little time, they flattered themselves with having gained a mighty advantage. When everyone was clamoring for water, the old guard took pity and ordered some skins of water. Holman immediately knew this would have fatal effects. He says, this was what I dreaded. I foresaw it would prove the ruin of the final chance left us, and I essayed many times to speak to him privately to forbid it. It is being walked, but, but the clamor was so loud it became impossible. So paradoxically, a humane gesture from a prison guard brought on the destruction of a crowd of thoughtless prisoners unable to rise above their animal instincts. As soon as the water arrived, there was a mad rush for it. Those near the window filled up their hats to the full, but there ensued such violent struggles and a frequent contest to get at it, that before it reached the lips of anyone, there would be scarcely a small teacup full left in there. 
The insufficient supply of water only increased the thirst. Quote, the confusion now became general and horrid. Several quitted the other window, the only chance they had for life, to force their way to the water, and the throng and press upon the window was beyond bearing. Many forcing their passage from the further part of the room pressed down those in their way who, who had less strength and trampled them to death. The scene inside the prison was one of violent confusion. The prison guards seemed to find this amusing. Holwell was incensed. He writes, Can it gain belief that this scene of misery prove entertainment to the brutal wretches without? But so it was, and they took care to keep us supplied with water that they might have the satisfaction of seeing us fight for it and held up lights to the bars that they might lose no part of the inhuman diversion. For Orwell, it was unforgivable that native eyes should have been allowed to witness the descent of a group of Europeans into a state of natural savagery. All he could do by way of retaliation was transfer the attribute of brutality from his own foolish compatriots to the amused Indian prisoners. By half past eleven, and I'm quoting again from Orwell, though they whose strength and spirits were already exhausted laid themselves down and expired quietly upon their fellows. Others who had some strength and vigor left made a last effort for the windows. Many to the right and left sunk with a violent pressure and were soon suffocated. For now, a scene arose from the living and the dead which affected us all in all its circumstances, as if we were forcibly held with our heads over a bowl full of strong volatile spirit of harshon until suffocated. By two o'clock, Holwell felt so exhausted that he pulled out his penknife, determined to slip open his arteries. When heaven interposed and says Holwell, restored me to fresh spirits and resolution with an abhorrence of the act of cowardice that I was just going to commit. Soon, however, he passed out. When the day broke, some of the prisoners recognized him by his shirt buried under a pile of naked dead bodies and realized he was still alive. In the meantime, the Nawab apparently gave orders that the prisoners be released. Holmes was taken to Sarajevo. After a drink of water, Holder tried to describe to the law the terrible suffering the prisoners had undergone. Quote, but he stopped me short with telling me he was very informed of great treasure being buried or secreted in the fort and that I was privy to it and if I expected favor, must discover it. Holder disclaimed all knowledge of any treasure. Frustrated, Siraj ordered him to be taken under guard to Mushinava as the capital. The prisoners were presented before Siraj in his capital. Quote, the wretched spectacle we made must, I think, have made an impression on the breast of the most brutal. And if he is capable of pity or contrition, his heart felt it then. I think it appeared in spite of him in his countenance. The Nawab ordered that the chains be removed and Holwell and his companions allowed to go wherever they chose. A final point before we leave Holwell's narrative. In the course of his description of the chaotic scenes inside the Black Hole prison, Holwell mentioned a certain naval officer called Cary and added in parentheses, almost as an afterthought, quote, his wife, a fine woman, though country born, would not quit him, but accompanied him into the prison and was one who survived. On the morning of June 21, after Holwell and three others were ordered to be sent to Mushadaba, the rest of the prisoners were set free, except, says Holwell, Mrs. Kale, who was too young and handsome. Other than this scandalizing brief clause, not a word more is said about her. Much would be made of Mrs. Kale later. We will come back to Mrs. Kale uh, later on. There is no doubt that Holwell had an axe to grind. 
civil and military leadership of the settlement had been gracefully abandoned the fort, and an order had been left behind to negotiate the inevitable surrender. The temptation would have been overwhelming for him to paint in the most dramatic colors the adversity of the situation and the heroism of his devotion to duty, especially in a tract intended to be read by the East India Company's stockholders and the members of the public in Britain. But a careful reader of the narrative cannot but conclude that the predominant theme it is not the brutality of the Bengal Nawab or his soldiers, but the value of mental self-discipline and informed moral judgment in coping with unanticipated disaster. The charge of brutality against Siraj is, in the narrative, nothing more than a prejudice, assumed as part of the background. He appears impatient and willful, perhaps, but not in any way cruel, and indeed not devoid of compassion. Some of his arts are positively helpful towards the prisoners. Homer's track is actually pedagogical, not academic. He was writing to establish what may be called elevated principles of moral discipline as a guide to self-government for his own people. What the Indians had seen of Europeans that night in Fort William had destroyed every claim of the civilizational superiority of white Christian nations. The task was, Holder seemed to be saying, to the moral education of the British people to make them worthy of ruling over Oriental peoples steeped in tyranny and depravity. In making this, this plea, he was somewhat ahead of the time. We will come back to this point because, in a sense, this is quite central to what I'm arguing. That what Orwell was saying was that the most of the British people who were going out to India were really still not, did not have the character of a superior civilization, of having, of coming from a superior civilization. And that is really what would be needed for claiming a kind of moral superiority over Oriental peoples, over whom the Europeans would claim to rule. And all of those saying, we still, in other words, he was, he was saying, let us civilize ourselves before we try and civilize others. So this would be a very important transition in the early 19th century, I would argue. It has often been said in the last two centuries that the British acquired the territories of India without ever having planned to do so. The description was turned into a much repeated aphorism by the historian John C., who remarked in 1882, quote, we seem, as it were, to have conquered and peopled half of the world in a fit of absence of mind. Of course, it is necessary to remind ourselves that the idea that empires are founded by single individuals of rare genius is a prejudice which has carried over from older histories of bygone empires. Modern empires, like modern capitalism and modern nation states, do not have founders, notwithstanding the persistent desire in certain quarters to claim and celebrate them. The founding of the British Empire in India is usually dated June 23rd, 1757 almost exactly a year after the Black Hole incident. On this day, the East India Company forces, led by Robert Clive, defeated Sirajadol on the feet of Palashi and installed Meet Jafar as the first of the series of puppet Nawabs of Mushirabad. The battle was preceded by an inglorious conspiracy between British officials and ministers of the Nawabs court involving deception, betrayal, forged signatures, and the transfer of unheard of quantities of money and treasure. The conspiracy ensued in short that about two-thirds of the Nawab's army merely stood by as the so-called revolution in Bengal took place. For the next eight years, the functionaries of the company carried out what can only be described as the unrestrained thunder of Bengal. Each official sent out the private Indian agents into the countryside to trade without paying taxes in virtually every commodity. 
They use the company's troops to support their private trade against competitors and to dictate prices. Profit margins for British traders in the world were two to three times what they could have expected in Britain. In certain commodities, they were seven, eight, ten times more than in Britain. And some commodities, the British actually declared as their monopolies. No Indians were allowed to trade, like salt. Um, yet another means of plunder was the so-called presents to company officials from Indians eager to please them. Robert Clyde, who regarded himself as morally superior to his greedy and self-serving compatriots in the world, appears to have stayed away from private trade, but took home probably the largest fortune of all, consisting mainly of money, jewels, and precious objects gifted to him, often from the government tradition, by prominent people in India. But Clive was not the only one. Anyone of any consequence in the company used his position to ask for and receive presents from Indians he dealt with. It was noted by an official committee in Britain that between 1757 and 1765, presents worth more than two million pounds taken out of Bengal could be actually listed. What tended to happen was that many of these people went back from India with enormous amounts of money, then bought their way into the English upper class. They bought land, they bought seats in parliament, they married into uh, aristocratic families, and then took on aristocratic titles. Clive himself was one of them. In 1765, Clive wrote, Quote, it is scarcely a hyperbole to say that the whole Mughal Empire is in our hands. He negotiated an, an agreement with the Emperor by which the East India Company acquired the right to collect land revenues of Bengal. This is what I, was, uh, I mentioned earlier. The land revenues of Bengal at this time were the, this, Bengal was the richest province at this time in the Mughal uh, in the Empire. And the revenues from Bengal due to the imperial treasury in Delhi uh, was an enormously large amount. So the East India Company offered to the Mughal Emperor at this time uh, that they would collect the revenue. Uh, they, they were declared the Duan of Bengal. They would collect the revenue and from this to deliver a particular amount every year. Uh, what the company collected was far more, of course. And that was the revenues out of which they financed the trade. Soon, a historical justification of the conquest of Bengal was worked out among company officials, repeated by them in debates in the parliament and in public. Unlike the earlier debates over the empire in America, there was no attempt here to apply the Roman law concepts of dominium and imperium. Nor was it possible to claim, in the manner of John Locke, that the British had titled the land in India because they were the first to productively cultivate it. Rather, the historical fiction was that the native inhabitants of India, whom the British then called the Gentiles, were industrious and skilled manufacturers and cultivators, adept at commerce, but naturally survived inherently incapable of defending themselves with arms. Not surprisingly, they had been conquered and ruled for centuries by warlike Muslim invaders referred to as Moors, who had imposed a vicious tyranny that had was hostile to trade and commerce. The British, drawn into the politics of the country in order to defend their trading interests, had been forced to seize power to protect and promote commerce. There was no promise at this juncture that the British would, under the given conditions, provide better government to the Indians. This needs a little explanation because the difference between the previous European empires in America and the new empire in Asia was very significant. In the Americas, as we know, the European conquerors after they settled, they began to administer 
the new settlements, the new white settler colonies, allow European prisoners. Uh, many of the most advanced and progressive political ideas of Europe at the time, in the 17th century, in the 18th century, were in fact practiced and institutionalized in the American colonies. Uh, we know that it was the American revolutions which were the first modern revolutions based on ideas such as popular sovereignty uh, and rule of law. Um, and many of the modern forms of representative government were all institutionalized and practiced in the white settler communities of the Americas. There was no attempt and no need, in fact, to try and accommodate the laws of property or the institutions of government or the social institutions of the Native American population into the forms of rule that the Europeans practiced in America. The Native American population, as we know, they were either killed or they were pushed back into marginal areas. Uh, they were not part of the political order at all. They were nowhere was it ever imagined that the Native Americans would be would form a part of the idea of the political community or the of the body of citizens. Uh, that would later, of course, with the various American revolutions uh, in the United States or in the early 19th century in South America with the Bolivarian revolutions. Nowhere was it imagined that the native population would become part. The other important component, of course, was the body of laborers in many, or particularly of the plantation colonies. These laborers were, of course, African slaves. Uh, brought to America through the Atlantic slave trade. And of course, as you know, the African slaves were never imagined to be part of the political community. They were completely excluded from all rights. The problem with the first European colonies in the East, and this begins, of course, in the, with the middle of the 18th was that these small European settlements, many of them actually within their settlements, they were ordered according to European laws. For instance, in the city of Calcutta, as in fact in the city of Madras, within the 45 settlement, it was English common law which was practiced. Uh, there were institutions of the mayor, of courts, particularly in relation to economic administration, law of contracts, and so on. Uh, it was English law that was applied. They were applied by English judges. But all of this was within that little European settlement there. With the acquisition of these land empires, first with Bengal and then in the south, in Madras, they acquired large provinces. The, in 1765, after the promise of Bengal uh, was annexed by the British and the, the British became revenue collectors, the land area was larger than France and Spain combined. It was, it was would have been the largest European country if you take the size of, of this, 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 this territory that was conquered. Uh, it was not possible to think of administering this territory purely according to European principles. The existing institutions of law and property, the whole range of revenue and administrative mechanisms had to be incorporated, had to be run by Europeans. And this initiated an entire process by which a completely new form of modern government had to be elaborated, which was often European in its conceptual terms, but an enormous range of non-European practices had to be included within the forms of administration. I will explain why this is so significant, because it seems to me that it opens up a somewhat unexplored field of 
European political theory and the emergence of the modern state itself, which of course the standard history says is a purely European development. I think it is a very, very important fact to remember that the forms of state, the modern state, the forms of the techniques of power and its entire theoretical and conceptual values includes the experience of administering these colonies in Asia, where enormous amounts of non-European practices and non-European forms of government have to be mixed with, within the same form, mixed with European forms, European concepts, and European uh, practices of government. I think this becomes the enormous uh, challenge that was opened up to Europe, to European, uh, I would say, to European political theory, in terms of its experience of acquiring the colonies of Asia. And this is what it seems to be the study of empire, or the study of empire, I would argue, is so central to an understanding of the forms of the modern state, even today. Uh, this, the crucial episodes are from precisely this period in the second half of the 18th century and the early 19th century. There is an enormously important transition that takes place here. I will come to this in a minute. In 1769-70, there was a massive famine in Bengal. Historians estimate that a third of the population of Bengal was wiped out, making it one of the worst famines in modern history. Its effects did not show up in the company's revenues, however, because collections from landowners and cultivators were, according to official reports and reserves, they were violently kept up to its former standard. In other words, enormous force was used in order to collect all the revenues, even though there was a famine. But it was apparent to all informed observers that there was a massive problem building up within the administration of the conquered province of Bengal. In addition, the financial improprieties and incompetence of the East India Company's directors precipitated in 1772 a huge crisis in London banking circles in which a dozen leading banks in the city went under, failed. But by then, a major campaign had been unleashed in the British press against the misrule and corruption of company officials in India and the menace of the India return money banks. After the banking crisis of 1772, the climate was so hostile to the company that most members of parliament seemed to be sort in a humor to hang both directors and servants. This is precisely the effect I was saying of the return of these enormously wealthy uh, colonial officials back, coming back to Britain from India and buying their way into parliament. It was estimated at this time that more than one third of the members of parliament in Britain actually owned stocks in the East India Company. So the East India Company was without any doubt the, the biggest interest group in Britain at this time. Uh, in 1773, Robert Clive, the much celebrated founder of the Indian Empire, was accused in the Parliament of having abused his powers to illegally acquire vast sums of money. In his defense, Clive told Parliament, and I'm quoting from his speech in the Parliament, Consider the situation in which the victory at Plassey had placed me. A great prince was dependent on my pleasure. An opulent city lay at my mercy. Its richest bankers bid against each other on my smiles. I walked through wards which were thrown open to me alone, piled on either hand with the gold and jewels. Mr. Chairman, at this moment I stand astonished at my own moderation. After a contentious hearings and a night long debate, he was found to have received presents, but was cleared of any criminal wrongdoing. Eight years later, however, the controversy resumed with no less of a figure than Edmund Burke. 
leading the charge in Parliament. Uh, no less a figure than Henry McGuck, leading the charge in Parliament against the company and its government general, Warren Hastings. Through protracted hearings and votes over more than a decade, Parliament debated the charges of high crimes and misdemeanors against Hastings, who claimed work had brought the British nation into disgrace. Hastings, he said, was the greatest delinquent that India ever saw. Along with the scores of other officials of the company who had misused their powers to prey upon the unfortunate and unnumbered inhabitants of India, Hastings had imbibed Eastern corruption, which was now making its way into British society. They marry into your families, they enter into your Senate. They ease your estates by loans. This was the dangerous underside of commerce that threatened to destroy virtue. Burke was determined to prevent such a disaster. In his defense, Hastings invoked the difference. India was not Britain, he said, and it could not be ruled by British principles. If he had, in his conduct, deviated from British norms, it was because Indian conditions demanded. The whole history of Asia is nothing more than a precedence to prove the invariable exercise of arbitrary power. Sovereignty in India implies nothing else than despotism. Burke, in his reply, was merciless. These gentlemen have formed a plan of geographic morality by which the duties of men in public are to be governed by climates, degrees of longitude and latitude. This was a license of corruption and an abuse of power. Burke's claim was that Indians had their own ancient constitution, their own laws, their own legitimate dynasties. A British governor, ruling by true British principles, ought to have respected those institutions and customs, and not, like Hastings, arrogantly cast them aside in order to introduce British forms with the substance of the despotism. Empire had to become a sacred responsibility, a patriotic duty answerable to the nation. It had to become a business not of intrigue and, and loot, but of virtue. As it happened, Hastings was in the end exonerated. But by bringing him to trial in Parliament, Burke made empire safe for British sovereignty by endorsing the claim that the good despotism it would provide was much better than the bad despotism India had known before Congress. This was the beginning of what I'm suggesting was a major transition in terms of the justification of empire. The argument no longer was that the British in India were simply defending their right to engage in commerce. The idea that if you had to lead in India, you also had to govern in India. This was a responsibility that was now being accepted, that the British would have to take the responsibility of governing India. But what would be the principles by which India had to be governed? India could not be governed by European principles. The principles would have to be those that were in accordance with the way Indians had always been governed. And those were the principles of arbitrary government, of despotism, of authoritarian rule, uh, the ideas of representation, of freedom of the individual. These were European ideas, they did not apply to India. But how would the Europeans justify this idea that they would have one set of principles at home and another set of principles in the public? This becomes the big debate. And following this Edmund Burke Hastings debate, the solution to this problem that I'm to devise was to say that Britain would rule India by authoritarian. But this would be a better authoritarian rule 
than anything that the Indians could provide themselves. In other words, the argument would be that we will rule by their principles, but we will rule better. <laughs> this becomes the principle of justification. We will see how important this is, because even in the most sophisticated liberal thinkers, such as John Stuart Mill, this would be an argument that would be built into the idea of modern political theory, that the colonies would be ruled according to an exceptional circumstance. Uh, I would argue that the modern state as we know it today was normalized in the early 19th century. The experience of empire in its earlier incarnation of the conquest and settlement of America, as well as the new possessions in the East, is fundamental to this process. In fact, I am willing to speculate that the modern state as we know it today would have looked very different had the European powers not had overseas empire. The key conceptual move was to think of all forms of government everywhere as comparable within a single universal normative framework. Some crucial theoretical instruments were provided in the 19th century by British utilitarian thinkers. In 1789, Jeremy Bentham announced that the methods and standards of legislation he was proposing were alike applicable to the laws of all nations. More interesting, Bentham proposed that by taking the laws of England for a standard, the best laws for every other country would be determined by measuring the necessary deviations from the standard set by England. Thus, he said, the climate, population, natural resources and products, the present laws, manners, customs and religion of the inhabitants of Bengal were as different as would be from England. But a lawgiver, bred up with English notions, could carefully adapt English laws to the circumstances of Bengal and give that country the best possible laws it could ever have. This is a very crucial conceptual move, I am suggesting. Cultural difference here is no longer radically incommensurable as 18th century Europeans brought up on Montesquieu would have assumed. Rather, it can now be understood as deviation from a standard and hence normalized. All deviations between states are comparable according to the same measures. States can be divided into ranks and grades. Moreover, once normalized, deviations could be tracked over time. The deviation of a state from the norm would close or widen. This, I believe, was a key conceptual innovation in the theory of the modern state in which the history of empire played a central role. Let me explain. What Bentham was suggesting, I think for the first time that anybody in the world has ever suggested this. He was suggesting that governments everywhere, anywhere, in any part of the world, for any kind of people, every government could be measured by the same standard. That there was a common measure by which all governments can be measured. So every form of government everywhere was now reduced to within to a common framework of measurement. Bentham, of course, is described this measure as utility. This is, of course, the standard uh, way in which utilitarians argue. Now, of course, there has been a lot of debate over uh, the notion of utility and whether or not utility can, in fact, be applied in this way, and so on. We don't have to go into this. So, the crucial point is that whatever that common standard might be and however we might measure it, whatever the, the, the unit by which we measure, the very idea that all governments can be measured by a common scale was completely new. What it meant was 
that it was possible to think of all governments everywhere in the world as representing certain norms or averages. The idea of average, because you have measure, you can have average. You can have a standard norm. And every single country can be indicated as either being the average type or above the average or below the average. So you have a deviation from the norm. What this means is that comparative government becomes possible. You can compare the laws of every country. You can compare the kind of government services that are delivered according to some common measures. Right? You can then say this is a better government, this is a worse government. Anywhere in the world. You can also compare over time the performance or the quality of a government over time because you have a measure, you have a norm, you have averages against which you can compare deviations. What this allows one to do is then open up what I'm suggesting two registers of comparison. Two One is a purely empirical comparison. You can adopt certain empirical measures, a certain standards by which you compare governments everywhere or the performance of governments everywhere according to some particular empirical measure. We do this all the time. You think of something like the United Nations Human Development Report or you take the Food Administration Report, or the ILO Report. Each one of these, you will have a complete list of countries of the world, and a measure such as, let's say, mortality rates, life expectancy, uh, standards of literacy, uh, standards of health. Any of these things you can arrive, you can Select a measure and you claim that all governments everywhere can be measured according to that scale. What that empirical measure tells you then is the location of any particular country from the average or the mean, that is to say, the empirical norm. You can say this country is better than the average, this country is worse than the average. But alongside, there is another meaning of the term norm. So the norm or the normal can be an empirical average, but the norm can also mean a desirable standard, that which is desirable, that which is an example. All right? Now, this is what we call the normative, the norm as the normative. No, the normative, of course, is presumably the highest standard. Sometimes it is called the best practices. So, you have two senses of the norm which give you two different registers. You take, first, you take any country and you take its empirical description first and you say this is better than the average. It is among the better. Which means that it is closer to the best possible standards, to the most desirable standards. It's close to the best possible standards. You take another country and you say its standards are worse than the average. And therefore, it must be, the deviation must be great from the most desirable standards. You connect this to an explanation of why is the performance of that country worse than the average. And invariably, the explanation will be something to do with the quality of the governance. That, in turn, can be connected with social conditions. 
let us say poverty, uh, lack of education, a whole range of things, and we are very familiar with this, which finally ends up in being essentially a cultural explanation. The prevailing practices, the prevailing beliefs, the prevailing sets of social norms in that country prevents or first of all explains its poor performance and secondly prevents that country from reaching the acceptably desirable standards, the normative standards. Once you have this explanation, and what I'm suggesting that in the practice of empire to the 19th century, this is the form of justification of empire that becomes ingrained in every respect. First, there is a description of that country and its prevailing standards. The prevailing standards are poor. The prevailing standards are below the average. Prevailing standards are worse than, far worse than the desirable standards. Why? Because its social conditions are poor. Its social conditions are backward. Its culture is backward. From this, you get the, the next argument. How can those standards be pushed up? How can those standards be brought closer to the desirable standards? And, and this is where you get a crucial policy question coming out. Should then, should you have the best possible standards being applied there? Or should there be an exception? And the standard response worked out, and this I'm suggesting from the time of work, from the work facing debate onwards through the 19th century. The standard policy response says that the best possible standards applicable to governments in the West, in Europe, cannot be applied because, in fact, the social conditions do not exist. The social conditions do not exist in those countries for the best possible standards to be applied. So you have to make an exception until such time that the social conditions can be improved and brought closer to the empirical conditions prevailing in the most advanced countries, the most advanced forms of government cannot be applied in those places. This becomes what I'm calling the colonial exception. The universal rule is that the best possible standards must apply. Those are the best everywhere. But because of the exceptional circumstances of the backward colony, those best possible standards cannot be applied in those places. This, I am suggesting, becomes the form of the justification of empire. It is a justification based on the argument of a colonial exception. It is not, it does not do any harm to the claim to the universal superiority of the Western standard. That remains. But the colony becomes an exception because it is an exception, the best standards cannot be applied. They remain suspended. The history of British India by James Mill, Virgil, who was an utilitarian, by the way, and uh, a very close associate of Benham. Uh, the history of British India, this is a book by James Mill, virtually canonical in the field of European knowledge in Indian history in the early 19th century, was first published in 1870. Mill was a utilitarian and a reformist thinker in the new Benthamite tradition. In his chapter on the capture of Calcutta by Siraj mentions the black hole incident, but frames it within a paradigm of social ethics that would have been incomprehensible to the 18th century characters we have encountered so far. Mill describes the confusion and disorder surrounding the retreat from the fort on June 1976 as bordering on criminal negligence of duty, but something that should have been expected given the lack of proper principles of governance in the affairs of the East India Company at the time. 
After the surrender of the fort, Bill says, following all the narrative, Siraj Dola did not show any cruelty to the British captives. When a search was undertaken for a suitable place to secure the prisoners, quote, this is quoting from Bill's book, information was obtained of a place which the Europeans, which the English themselves had employed as a prison. Into this, without any further inquiry, they were impelled. It was unhappily a small, ill air and an unwholesome dungeon called the Black Hole. And the English had their own back list to thank for suggesting, to it, suggesting it to the officers of Siraj as a fit place of confinement. In a footnote, Mill remarks, had no Black Hole existed, as none ought to exist anywhere, least of all in the sultry and an unwholesome climate of Bengal, those who perished in the black hole of Calcutta would have experienced a different effect. As you can see, Mill was in fact blaming the British for the black hole of Calcutta. He was saying, why was there such a, a, a dungeon in, in the fort? Had no such thing existed, well, nobody would have been killed. This was the intellectual climate in which Hallwell's black hole monument was demolished in 1821. It has been speculated Quote, that its continuance had become politically undesirable, either as likely to wound the sensibilities of our native fellow subjects or to recall prominently at the seat of government a hideous disaster to British arms, which it would be wiser to locally bury in oblivion. They did not want to remind the people of India that, in fact, the British had been badly defeated in that battle. However, that is the original Hollywood monument. However, it is also likely that its inappropriate use by local people contributed to the decision to pull down the monument. An early 19th century illustration by Fraser, that is the word, that shows the original monument drew the following comment later. The obelisk in the last name engraving looks at least 50 feet high and is not surrounded by any railings. It seems in consequence to be the lounging place for lower class loafers of all sorts who gossip sitting around and against it. A barber is seen plying his craft in the favorite posture of these Eastern experts. His back is to the base of the monument, while overhead is stretched his outspread cloth between the upper ledge of the pedestal and three or four sticks. The tent thus improvised shelters the operator and a few of his customers. All this unsightliness may explain why the historic structure had a few years before the date of this engraving disappeared from the city of Paris. In any case, we have a report in the Calcutta Journal in 1821 announcing that the monument over the well-remembered black hole of Calcutta is at length taken down and we think should long ago have been demolished. A combination of utilitarianism and evangelical Christianity brought in an era of high imperialism in the 19th century. This was when representative government was gradually declared the normal form of the modern nation state, applicable universally as the desirable norm. But actual historical conditions might require the making of exceptions. Indeed, the theoretical foundation of the modern empire as defined in the 19th century now rested precisely in the power to declare the colony as an exception. Race, religion, language, geography, historical tradition, any of these could be the criteria for deciding that the colonies inhabited by non-European people were not ready for the representative government. But the difference too was normalized within a universal framework of comparative government where the difference was now conceived as deviation from the norm. Deviation was susceptible to correction over time, as the utilitarians and the evangelists agreed. Thus was born in the 19th century the modern civilizing mission, education, empire as an educational project. This becomes the new justification for empire, that an empire was necessary in order to civilize the people of the colony to raise their cultural standards so that the universally best standards would finally 
we've given to them. If we are indeed prepared to see metropolis and colony as part of a single history, then we must not be content merely with showing interactions and crossovers in both directions. We must take seriously the history of 19th century individualism as a constitutive part of the history of the modern nation state in Europe and North America. If we do this, we will see why, alongside the growing power of the bourgeoisie and the extension of the suffrage in British domestic politics, colonial government in the 19th century was run by men from the British upper middle classes with the university education in the classics, suffused by a patrician spirit of virtue that had disappeared from British domestic politics. We will see why a paternal authoritarianism could be justified for the colonies with such moral fervor, and why its frequently arbitrary policies could even be concealed from an allegedly uninformed and uncomprehending metropolitan public opinion. So the black hole of Calcutta would have been forgotten had it not been for the essayist skills of Thomas Macaulay. In 1840, he wrote an essay on Robert Clive that was read by every English reading school child for the next hundred years. This essay turned the black hole story into a founding myth of empire. In the early 19th century, at the time when the Holloway's monument was pulled down, there was much embarrassment in Britain about the conspiracies and plunder surrounding the conquest of Bengal. Many preferred to draw a secret veil over that story. By, by 1840, the mood had changed. I have always thought it strange, began the colleague, that while the history of the Spanish Empire in America is familiarly known to all the nations of Europe, the great actions of our countrymen in the East should even among themselves, among ourselves, excite little interest. Yet the victories of Cortes were great were gained over savages who had no letters, who were ignorant of the use of metals, who had not broken in a single animal to labor. The people of India, when we subdued them, were ten times as numerous as the Americans whom the Spaniards vanquished and were at the same time quite as highly civilized as the Victoria Spaniards. It might have been expected that every Englishman who takes an interest in any part of history would be curious to know how a handful of his countrymen, separated from their home by an immense ocean, subjugated in the course of a few years one of the greatest empires in the world. Yet, unless we greatly err, this subject is, to most readers, not only insipid, but possibly distasteful. And all his essay was tragic biography and heroic history. So the black hole played the crucial part in it. India in the middle of the 18th century, he wrote, was tainted with all the vices of Oriental despotism, with a succession of rulers sunk in indolence and debauchery, chewing arm, that is cannabis, fondly compromised and listening to our phones. Macaulay betrayed a wholly new historical sensibility when he asked the question, in what was this confusion to end? Was the strife to continue during centuries? This was when an utterly unexpected and wholly providential chain of events unfolded. Siraj, one of the worst specimens of the Oriental despot, committed that great crime, memorable for its singular atrocity, memorable for the tremendous retribution by which it was followed, turning all this narrative into a story, um, sorry, turning all this narrative into a story of the criminal cruelties of Oriental rulers, Macaulay made Siraj the chief perpetrator of a horrible atrocity. Having ordered the forced confinement of the unfortunate prisoners at the point of the sword, the despot was unavailable for the rest of the night for any appeals because he was sleeping off with the watch. In the morning, he treated the survivors with execrable cruelty. And the mysterious Mrs. K, now called an English woman, was, according to Macaulay, placed in the harem of the prince at Mushidabad. What happened next? 
And the cry of the whole settlement was for vengeance. And the cry was heard in Madras and London, leading to the dispatch of Clive and his small army to Bengal. The rest, we might say quite accurately, in history. So we can see how the Hollywood's narrative has been changed. Siraj becomes the main villain in this whole story. Uh, Mrs. Carey, who was only mentioned in half of race in Orwell, now is shown as having been the price of Siraj's victory. Mrs. Carey, this English woman, is taken to his harem. All of this becomes the new moral story of why empire was necessary. It is through history that Macaulay turned in judging time. He admitted that I considered oriental politics as a game in which nothing was unfair. And although an honorable English gentleman and a soldier, no sooner was he matched against an Indian intriguer than he became himself an Indian intriguer and descended without scruple to falsehood. In doing this, I says Macaulay, was altogether in the wrong. There can be no moral defense of his conduct. But history must give such men a more than ordinary indulgence, because they must be judged not as their contemporaries judge them, but as they will be judged by posterity. This judgment would be that Clive was a supremely intelligent and valorous agent of the providential acquisition by Britain of its Indian empires. His faults were the faults of a bygone era. Now, says Macaulay, a great quantity of wealth is made by English functionaries in India, but no single functionary makes a very large fortune. And what is made is slowly, hardly, and honestly earned. The institutions of British rule in India had been reformed. Empire was now safe from its own infamous origins. The secret veil could now be lifted. It is vitally important, I think, to emphasize the novelty of the empires instituted in the 19th century, because they invented and put in place global technologies of power that remain with us even today. Thus, the fact that the British Empire in India was, in the 19th century, so crucially dependent on collaborating Indians, from soldiers to merchants to landlords to clerks, was not a limit on imperial power at all, but precisely its mark of productive explosions, productive power. It is equally important, I believe, to take seriously the myth of imperial religion. Not because the actual British experience of empire was homogeneous, which it was not, but because actual practices were effectively instituted that sustained and made credible to the myth of invincible imperial hegemony. The history of the Black Hole Monument is a perfect example. In fact, it is with monuments like this that the story that British power was invincible, that it actually could never be defeated, was sought to be imposed on the Indian uh, landscape. The, the campaign to restore the monument began in earnest in the 1880s. It is very interesting that it is only at the turn of the late, in the late 19th century, when in fact nationalist opposition to British rule begins. In, in, in earnest, that the campaign to restore the monument, to put another monument in its place, in the place of the old Holland monument, was uh, mounted. Basi published a history of Calcutta, recounting in detail the history of the black hole and bemoaning the fact that there was no commemorative structure sacred to those few faithful found among the faithless. He also claimed that Mrs. Carey with, um, was not the only woman in the black hole. There were probably three or four others, even though he doubted that she had been consigned to the Nawab's harem. Interestingly, there is an object on display today in the Victoria Memorial Hall of Calcutta, a snuff box, supposedly belonging to Warren Hastings, which carries a portrait of Mrs. Carey, a survival of the black hole. 
There is rich irony in the discovery that Mrs. Carey, allegedly consigned to a harem in Mushidabad, also found her way into Paul and Hastings' snuff box. Excavations were carried out in 1883 among the ruins of the old fort and the foundations of the Blackwood prison were was identified. In 1902, Curzon took it upon himself, Curzon was the viceroy at this time, took it upon himself to rebuild at considerable personal expense the monument at the corner of the Square. This was the monument uh, in 1902. In 1902, uh, yeah, uh, he also paved and fenced the site of the Blackboard prison and put up plaques to instruct visitors on the historical memory associated with the place. This was also the person's monument. This is sometime in 1910, I think, this, this picture. Curzon um, certainly had no doubts about the nobility as well as the legitimacy of his civilizing mission. But by then, Indian opinion was in no mood to accept the founding myth of Nepal. In 1896, Varanath Chandra published an article in which he questioned whether it was possible to pack 146 humans into a room 18 feet square even if it were possible to closely pack them like the seeds of a pomegranate. He concluded, geometry contradicting arithmetic gives the lie to the story. In 1898, the historian Okai Kumar published an influential book on Siraj in which he challenged the European accounts of the Nawab's misrule and cruelties. In 1916, he was joined by a British schoolmaster, J. H. Little, in the Calcutta Historical Society, in pronouncing that the story of the black hole was a gigantic hoax, provoking a long and angry response from Curzon himself, then living in retirement in Britain. By then, the Bengali poets and playwrights had turned Siraj into a tragic hero, the last sovereign ruler of Bengal, the founding myth of the empire, and had been turned into the founding calendar. In 1940, there was an elected provincial ministry in Bengal consisting of a coalition of Muslim political parties. Led by Subhash Chandra Bose, then banished from the Indian National Congress, various students organizations began a campaign for the removal of Curzon's Black Hole Monument from the central square of the city. The movement aroused a surprising response, spreading quickly from district to district and invoking sentiments extremely unusual for those days of sectarian conflict of a joint front of Hindus and Muslims against a colonial Canada. Pressurized by its own constituents, the government of Fadullah decided in July 1940 to remove the monument from the Lazi Square to St. John's Church where it still stands in the power of security. That's the Following the independence of India, many monuments of British imperial governors and generals were removed from the streets and parks of Calcutta and replaced by statues of nationalist leaders. But there is also a parallel awareness of the need to preserve the architectural and aesthetic heritage of what was once a colonial city. Thus, some colonial buildings have been put to new use. The residence of the colonial governor is now the National Library. And some colonial sites have been invested with new nationalist historical narratives. Thus, the central administrative building, writer's building of colonial Calcutta, is now remembered as the place where three nationalist revolutionaries shot and killed a senior British official. Other colonial structures, such as the Black Hole Monument, have been simply forgotten. In fact, that place, the side of the black hole, uh, now looks like this. It is a garbage dump. It's a garbage dump. <laughs>
One, one cannot blame the fickleness of popular memory for the obliteration of the black hole. In 1947, the famous Indian historian Jodhana Sarkar claimed that Orwell's story was an exaggeration and that the total number of prisoners who died was probably 60, not 123. In 1962, Brigitte Gupta published what is considered the definitive historical work on the subject, in which he considered every available piece of evidence and came to the conclusion that the number of dead was 53, among whom many were probably injured from the three days each, a not unusual incident in 18th century warfare. The historian's consensus today can be gauged from the fact that the volume published in 1987 in the new Cambridge History of India on the conquest of Bengal, it's a 300 page volume. It does not even list the black hole in its index, not a single mention is made of this incident. It is not worthy of even a mention. Curzon's paved and fenced site of the black hole has now become the rubbish now. So has the star of India, a uh, star of empire, finally collapsed into a black hole. I doubt it. While the great European empires all came to an end in the 1960s, we know that the world has since passed into an age of empire without colonies. Countries are still compared by universal global standards and ranked according to universally desirable norms. Deviations from the norm are still explained by the differences in culture. As in the heyday of empires, while practices of advanced nations are still held out as universally desirable norms, the colonial exception is also declared, justified on the same ground of immaturity and backwardness. Those who declare that exception continue to exercise an imperial privilege. Moreover, with new powers emerging on the global scene, the imperial privilege is now likely to be exercised by several regional hegemons. We know from imperial history that a democracy at home is no guarantee against pursuing despotism abroad. Lodged in the comfort of our self-confident post-coloniality, we would do well, therefore, not to forget the history of empire. Let me finally make a couple of comments in terms of some of the uh, discussions we had yesterday uh, on uh, Joe's presentation of uh, imperialism. He said imperialism is alive and well today, which is, of course, also a theme I am suggesting. Uh, one of the questions that was raised yesterday was the relevance of something like defining empire in terms of economic criteria uh, to economic practices uh, of exploitation. One of the uh, arguments that could be made is of course to locate the ground on which empire or imperial practices can be defined. Uh, any form of inequality cannot simply be attributed to empire. Uh, there can be inequalities between nations on all sorts of grounds. Simply, the existence of inequality is not a ground for suggesting that there is some kind of imperial relationship. Imperialism, it seems to me, and this is one of the arguments that I'm making, can only be described on the ground of Sovereignty. It is fundamentally a political criteria by which the uh, existence of some sort of imperial structure or imperial formation can be described. It is a question of whether or not the sovereignty of particular countries, or particular nations, are given the status of equality. In other words, imperialism is necessarily a violation of the rule of equal sovereignty. Uh, if you look, if one looks at, this is one of the things I was trying to suggest earlier, if one looks at the history of the way in which the idea of sovereignty 
and alongside the history of the law of nations, what is called the law of nations now, or international law, developed in Europe. It was very much an argument of a practice that was confined within the European nations themselves. The idea of sovereignty in the modern sense as some notion of unique jurisdiction over a particularly clearly defined boundary territory. This is the notion of sovereignty as it developed in Europe, particularly from the 17th and 18th centuries. It was an idea that depended on the recognition of sovereignty by others. In other words, one had sovereignty only to the extent that other sovereign nations recognized the sovereignty, otherwise sovereignty means nothing. This is precisely what developed in Europe, among the European nations, through particularly from the 17th century onwards. One knows, for instance, uh, from in fact the date 1648 is suggested as a particularly crucial date, the so-called Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, and this was the first treaty in Europe where a peace settlement was made with attached maps. Maps were attached to the treaty, which defined specific boundaries of national states as recognized by the other states. This was the idea that was of sovereignty that was brought to Asia with European empires. Previously, within Asian understandings of sovereignty, sovereignty was never defined in traditional terms in these clearly bounded forms of exclusive jurisdiction over it. There were often many different authorities who had jurisdiction over the same territory, overlapping jurisdictions. Uh, it was often not clear whether the jurisdiction was over a territory or over a people. Much of this depended upon customary rules of practice, uh, the idea of having treaties with maps with clearly defined boundary lines and so on did not exist. The Europeans brought this and initially when treaties were made with Asian powers, the treaties were made not so much in order to respect Asian practices of sovereignty, but rather to regulate the relations between European powers themselves. So, very often, when the British or the Portuguese or the Dutch concluded treaties with Asian rulers, sometimes after uh, a, a war or a battle, or over economic privileges, the reason why it was important for them to put this down in writing in a treaty was not so much that they were uh, mindful of how this treaty would be interpreted later on by the same Asian rulers or by other Asian rulers, but more in terms of whether the French would claim something or the Portuguese would or the Dutch would claim something. It was really to regulate the completing European interests in Asia that it became important for them to clearly define what their claims were or rights were over particular Asian territories. So it was essentially as an extension of the European ideas of sovereignty and relations between European nations that the law of nations became extended to uh, Asia. Uh, many of these treaties, of course, were made at the time on the understanding that the Asian rulers had sovereignty. We were talking about, let's say, the various treaties that the East India Company made with, uh, with the Mughal Emperor, for instance, or even with provincial rulers. In many of these, the East India Company was gaining privileges. They were claiming new privileges. In other words, there was a certain surrender of sovereignty. 
by the Mughal Emperor to the British. And it was important for the British to recognize this in a treaty because, of course, if they were claiming that the Mughals had surrendered the, the, the sovereign powers or part of the sovereign powers, you have to first acknowledge that the Mughals have sovereignty. Only if you have sovereignty can you give, give, give it up, right? So precisely in order to justify their gaining sovereign powers from Asian rulers, they first have to acknowledge that the Asian powers were also equal, equally sovereign. Now, because of a treaty, they were giving up this power. This is how they began to acquire sovereignty. But over time now, and this becomes the interesting question, precisely through the 19th century, the argument would be made that Asian rulers actually are not really sovereign. They, they, they don't, because they don't really belong to the family of nations. Uh, in the 19th century, particularly with the advance of European uh, colonies into Africa, it has become even more important. Uh, Westlake, one of the great sort of uh, international lawyers in Britain, uh, in the middle of or, yeah, 1870s, he basically said, well, African chiefs, African rulers have no concept of sovereignty. How can they give up sovereignty? Right? So therefore, the argument becomes now that only Europeans probably have a concept of sovereignty. Others are not simply part of the family of nations. Uh, so the peculiar situation was that with the advance of a kind of global spread of European power, the family of nations become smaller and smaller. Um, it is only with the early 20th century, with the First World War, the League of Nations, and of course later with the success of the anti-colonial movements, the anti-imperial movements, that by the 1960s, particularly within the framework of the United Nations, you have, for the first time, a situation where every nation is formally declared to have equal sovereignty. That is the formal structure of the United Nations. That is reflected in the General Assembly. We were discussing this yesterday. But you will notice even within the structure of the United Nations, the exceptions to this. The exceptions, of course, are in the Security Council. The structure of the Security Council. Well, some, where some members have the right to a veto, others not. Uh, yesterday, there were a whole series of UN institutions that Jomo was, uh, was describing, whose structures, although formally based on the idea of equal sovereignty, actually incorporates huge exceptions. Exceptional parts, which are given to some, some have more sovereignty than others. What I'm suggesting is that if we are to understand the continuity between that older structure of empire, where of course there was formal territorial control over colonies, today you do not have territorial control of colonies, you have a form of empire without colonies. But the basic framework of practices continue to be the same. And they are the same because, in fact, the characteristic feature of empire is not so much territorial sovereignty over another place. The formal feature is precisely the privilege of declaring the exception. Who declares the exception? Those who claim to declare the exception are exercising an immediate To this extent, it seems to me you can make the argument that on the on a ground of equal sovereignty, all of these features of unequal claims to privilege, that is the fundamental structure of immediate power. Associated with that are all of those techniques of power which are based precisely on that distinction and the kind of suggested between the empirical description which provides 
a global average by which you can compare every country in the world, and then the claim that you can make a policy decision based on an exception, which is justified by the ground that a particular country deviates from the norm so much that the exception can be made or must be made. It seems to me that that is a form that continues even today. The final point I wanted to make was in relation to the question of monuments and memories, which is how I opened it. The discussion. And as I said, that there are several ways in which we can think of how colonial monuments and the traces of colonial history are remembered or not remembered. Um, just as we can remember colonial history, we can also choose to forget it. Uh, you have examples of both kinds. As I said, one is, of course, to simply obliterate and destroy a colonial monument, something that reminds uh, post-colonial people of a part of their history that they do not wish to remember. Uh, many countries of the world, you will find colonial monuments have been simply removed or destroyed. They don't exist anymore. Uh, sometimes they are given a new name, giving it a new name or giving it a new use changes the story. It changes the narrative. And as I said, there are many ways in which the same event can be told in different ways in order to tell a different story. Uh, this too happens in many places. Uh, and finally, over this, there is often a divergence between the interests of the historian or the scholar and the interests of, you might say, an ordinary public. Um, the difference is simply this, that for many historians and scholars, they often treat the physical appearance of a city itself as a historical evidence, itself as a kind of archive. And so one travels, one looks at many of these uh, remains of an older period of history, and if they are well preserved, then that is for us, many of us, itself a historical record of how it was 100, 200, Years ago. Uh, but this is a scholarly interest. Uh, it is in the interest of scholars and uh, conservationists and so on who are most worried about preserving heritage. Um, the other was to preserve a physical record in sight uh, of a particular historical period or an event. For Ordinary people, this may not be how they look at buildings and sites and places. Uh, they very often look at it in terms of more mundane, everyday concerns, the way they use these places, the way these places um, have come to them as part of a, an inherited set of practices where these scholarly concerns may have no relevance at all. So they probably know any of these places and buildings with completely different significance from the significance we attach to them. Uh, and if that is the case, of course, the functions of these places will often change. Uh, the demand of historians and, uh, and conservationists to preserve these places may not have a, a major political uh, impact. The political impact may be driven by completely other considerations. And I think in many places, including uh, China today, uh, these kinds of pressures and amount of pressures operate. Um, there is no simple way of trying to resolve this, um, except to say that there is no one significance attached to any of these memorials or buildings and so on. The original intention of the people who put up these buildings or put up these monuments, well, those original intentions may not necessarily uh, die anymore. 
um, a lot of ways in which these kinds of stories change, and the significance that we attach to historical models also change. Um, so I will stop there, uh, and we can have uh, a lot larger discussion later.